Dobry wieczór, witam Państwa serdecznie podczas naszego dzisiejszego webinaru w serii Mistrzowie. Nasz dzisiejszy webinar będzie przeprowadzony w języku angielskim. So I'm going to talk in English now. I have just uh, welcomed our audience and just uh, said that we are going to be talking English. Let me introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Alice Rothstorn. Uh, who is an award-winning design critic and author whose books include Hello World, Where Design Meets Life, and most recently, Design as an Attitude. Her weekly design column for the New York Times was syndicated worldwide for over a decade. Alice has been awarded with an OBE for services to design and the arts. She is also a co-founder with Paula Antonelli of the Design Emergency Project to investigate design's response to the COVID-19 crisis and its aftermath. Hello, Alice, and thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for for uh, for your time and for being with us. Uh, to, tonight, we are going to talk about your project um, that you have founded with your partner in crime, as you <laughs> as you say, with uh, Paula Antonelli, uh, 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 Design Emergency. And after almost six months of living with the COVID. Um, who needs to hear about what is there to be done or is being done by designers during the pandemic and after it? Well, it's a very good question. Um, Paula is, of course, a very influential design curator. She's the senior curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And we've been great friends for many years. And when the pandemic started on my Instagram, on which for five years I've every day I post, I choose a theme every week um, of a different aspect of design. And every day I post about a different design interpretation of it. So, of course, when coronavirus struck, I started a design in a pandemic strand um, intended to last for a week. There were so many incredible projects. I continued it for another week and then I decided I'd continue it intermittently. And Paula and I just used to Zoom as friends to chat. And she said, look, we've got to do something together. And lots of people were doing IG lives at the time. So we decided that we'd launch Design Emergency as um, a way to investigate the design response to COVID-19 initially by interviewing interviewing the people who we thought were the global leaders in the design response with weekly 30-minute IG Live. So these were people like Michael Murphy, who's a great humanitarian architect, who has designed sort of infection-proof healthcare facilities all over the world, including many in Africa after the Ebola epidemic. Alyssa Eckert, the medical illustrator who designed the spiky blob that we now all recognize as um, COVID-19 and, and so on. Um, and we were always determined that we would also fling it forward because we believed that the design, design had really shone during the pandemic, at a time where of fear, of uncertainty, of confusion, chaos, death and destruction, people needed good news stories. And it was evident that design was much um, higher profile in the general media and that many of the successful design innovations to treat COVID-19 and to help us to adjust our lives, to adapt to it, were really being sort of analysed in a much more intelligent and thoughtful way than ever before. So we felt that this would serve designed very well. Both Paula and I have battled for years to diffuse the silly old-fashioned stereotypes that design is just a styling and PR tool by trying to convince people that it can be one of our most useful tools in any emergency, social, economic, political, cultural, ecological, and so on. So we really felt that COVID-19 was a great case study and that after the pandemic, there will be a real general will to redesign and reconstruct our lives to make them fit for purpose. We all knew they weren't before this terrible global crisis. So this surely is a golden opportunity to make sure that they are in the future. So we felt by documenting design's response to COVID-19 and analysing it, we would be helping with that process. Um, but a couple of months ago, we embarked on the second longer term phase of design emergency, which is 
to investigate the people who, again, we're convinced will be the global leaders of the reconstruction of our lives in the future. So we've begun that process. People like the pioneering social designer Hilary Cottam. We have Es Devlin coming up, um, who before the pandemic was the world's leading set and, and performance designer. Yeah, she has right. incredible ideas about how we can redesign collective experiences post-pandemic. So now we're really looking forward to the future. Um, are you convinced? that in general, we as a society, we, we as people are wise enough to take this experience, to take, to take these designs and implement it in our lives, to redesign the health system, to redesign the way we think about healthcare, about other people, about how design conserves the purpose and gets the role in deserves. Well, I very much hope we will be, and we will be incredibly foolish if we're not. And undoubtedly, there will be some incompetent gov or negligent, irresponsible governments who don't seize this opportunity, but others will. If you look at what happened in Asia, um, Southeast Asia, specifically after SARS, there was a significant change in the design of healthcare resources in many countries, China to some degree, Taiwan, South Korea, and so on. And that has already enabled many of those countries to deal with COVID-19 much, much, much more efficiently than their counterparts in the Americas and in Europe, Africa, and other parts of the world, because they did learn lessons from the terrible SARS crisis, which was a terrifying time in all those regions. So they did redesign their existing healthcare facilities and design new ones with infection proof in mind. And of course, introduced other social systems, behavioral systems that again, have made it much easier for them to be brisk and efficient in their response to COVID-19. I'm sure that other countries will learn their lessons from the past SARS crisis and many others. Yeah, there's also uh, uh, the question about the uh, how how a given society can stick to the rules and how uh, how uh, this uh, responsiveness to how system is designed uh, is implemented in the culture in the way certain societies behave. Because if you mention Asia, it is you know we all know that this is also a different type of behaviors that people are rather willing to stick to the rules and they are willing to uh, follow them. Even if you design it differently nowadays, given all the lessons we hopefully will learn, it may be hard to convince societies, societies in the Western countries with different movements nowadays to stick to the rules even if they are redesigned. But you've been mentioning um, a lot of good, uh, good design, but also uh, some time ago during your design in Daba speech, uh, you said that very little design is actually great. Very little of it is even any good. Most of it is Medicare and an enormous amount of it is damn right bad. And during your research uh, for the design emergency uh, project, have you come across any very bad design that you, you know, you just, uh, that blow your mind and you figured, oh my goodness, how this could ever even, you know, be thought of? Sadly, yes, there's all too much of it um, around. And I have exposed a lot of it on design in a pandemic and design emergency. Um, and one area where there is significant evidence of, of bad design, and sadly, our frontline health and social care workers are bearing the brunt of it, is personal protective equipment, or PPE, as we call it for short, um, in Britain. Now, the search for PPE, which was in short supply all over the world, with the exception of um, very efficient countries with a flair for forward planning, like Germany, Scandinavia, Southeast Asia, um, this has been one of the clarion calls for designers and makers throughout um, the pandemic, to make sure that our frontline health and social care workers have the equipment that they need. Now, the terrible truth is that despite the generosity, the resourcefulness, the imagination with which many, many people, you know, I have friends who are theatre, stage and film costume designers who have spent months and are still using their skills, using their knowledge and their contacts to mass produce PPE. So there's been a huge um, increase in the volume of production 
But there are massive problems with the design, particularly in the mass manufactured PPE by medical equipment makers. So there's a, a sadly notorious selfie that a British nurse posted a couple of months ago of the scars, grazes and chafing on her face after a 13 hour shift in critical care just from the facial PPE that she had to wear. Um, it wasn't fit for purpose. It was too heavy. It was abrasive. You know, it did at least shield her physically, but meant that she was in constant pain throughout. And undoubtedly, that would have impeded her ability to work for some degree. There's also a huge problem with cleaning a lot of PPE, certainly cleaning it in a sustainable way. It's so expensive and time consuming and complicated to clean a lot of the PPE that's used in the National Health Service here in the UK, but it's actually burnt by the hospitals at the end of every day. I mean, that is a horrific waste of resources that's environmentally damaging in itself. And often the best intentioned of design endeavours don't quite work out. So there was a surge of enthusiasm among designers, makers, architects, engineers, and sort of PPE making volunteers in London right at the beginning of lockdown here in the UK, um, when it was dis the, discovered that with fairly basic 3D printing kit, you could 3D print um, transparent plastic face shields. So this seemed very sensible. You know, you save material. They were 3D printed from a single sheet of plastic with none of the fasteners. It sped up production. It turned out they were absolutely impossible to clean. They all had to be scrapped and different, more efficient um, um, forms of PPE produced. So sadly, despite the best of intentions and also success in many fields, not all the design responses to COVID-19 have been effective and some of them have been damaging. Um, you have listed eight characters, characteristics of what the bad design is. And as you mentioned, uh, badly designed PPEs, I, I thought about lazy uh, as being one of the characteristics, because maybe if I know that those designers and people were um, uh, were acting in in a hard time during a hard uh, time pressure and also the effectiveness pressure, but maybe if they would have given the second thought to what they were doing, the project might be more sustainable because in the way they were designed at that moment, it was also a step back for all the uh, environmentally friendly consciousness some other people have been building for years and um, this is the general question uh, if giving the second thought to design despite the fact that you need to act during the time pressure is something that you would advise to designers in general um, in ideal circumstances yes but as, as you said I mean the pandemic was absolutely extraordinary and extreme circumstances on any criteria. It happened with such speed. There was so much uncertainty. Um, you know, it's very difficult to pronounce the, the real word for the cause of um, COVID-19. It's so long, so complicated. You know, the most eminent um, scientists and medical researchers in the field knew very little about this terrible menace that faced us all. So I would be wary of criticising designers and makers who volunteered their time with the best of intentions, given they were working at such speed in such um, extreme situations, I would be less wary of criticising the politicians who, um, you know, for example, the British government um, had been uh, had commissioned various research studies on what it should be doing in case there was a sudden global pandemic, and none of the recommendations were pressed into action. One of the recommendations was to increase production of and stockpile PPE, emergency ventilators, and other standardised equipment. Now, had the government done that, it could have done so in a much more measured situation where the manufacturers really did have time to experiment, to run new tests, to, as you say, think carefully um, um, about what they were doing. So I think that would have been a better context within which sustainable design innovation um, could have developed. Yeah, so we should basically design political innovation also and make the, the governments listen to researchers and to uh, designers and to people that know based on facts and experience, not on the uh, political uh, likes. 
Um, I, I was also wondering, uh, you've mentioned uh, designers that, has that have volunteered to work for the um, uh, for the pandemic to, uh, to fight it. Uh, the most important issue in designing any item is collaboration. There's also, you mentioned on your design emergency um, um, project, and uh, collaboration is to the key to success in design and generally in many other social and economic disciplines. Uh, what makes one collaboration successful and others not? What, based on your experience and on your uh, enormous knowledge of design, what makes it successful for designs uh, to be successful as far as collaboration is concerned? Ooh, well, um, the success for collaboration is inevitably determined by the quality of the outcome and its long term impact, because ideally a successful collaboration shouldn't simply fulfill and achieve its declared objective. It should also have medium and longer term benefits for the people involved. So I'm going to cheat slightly. And one of the best descriptions of a design collaboration I've heard was from Dries Verbruggen, who we interviewed for Design Emergency. Um, he was one of the co-founders of a huge collaborative network that was set up in Antwerp in Belgium by a group of friends, including Dries, in the Antwerp fashion and design communities and it was to design and make PPE that was sustainable and was fit for purpose for Belgian health and social care workers and he speaks in detail about the difficulties the problems the stresses the strains but also the opportunities that they went through it's an incredibly thoughtful and imaginative collaboration which morphed in different directions at many different times but will have a long-term impact but if I had to sort of crystallize what I think a really good collaboration will be. I will sound like a 19th century moralist because it is qualities like honesty, realism, prudence, pragmatism and empathy. In the past, I think when design was largely deployed as a commercial discipline, collaborations were all often used as sort of Trojan horses, you know, cunning ploys with which designers could nip in to other sectors and steal lots of commercial business from them. People have to have much more open-minded um, and honest and straightforward um, attitudes to collaboration in the future. And I think it's telling that certainly some of my personal favourite examples of collaboration during this crisis and at any other time ha haven't been from the professional design community. They have been from citizens and they would be um, collaborations that I think have made a profound difference to the treatment of COVID-19 in the UK and many other countries. And these are the community self-help groups that are set up, the sort of voluntary support networks, whereby neighbours who do feel resilient and healthy um, volunteer to look after more vulnerable people who live in their community. So they help them with shopping, collecting prescriptions, walking dogs, chatting to them, and, and so on. I mean, I immediately joined my community self-help group here in East London. There were more volunteers than there are vulnerable neighbours, but um, right. we were all slightly yeah. thwarted, but that's great. But I mean, my favourite example is in India, where actually after the Bombay influenza pandemic in 1918, which was called Spanish flu in most of Europe, mm -hmm. probably not in Spain, but was a terrible pandemic that killed millions of people globally. Um, one of the phenomena that protected um, the Indian nation at the time was the formation of voluntary uh, volunteer networks throughout the country. And these continued ever since in the form of women's self-help groups and tens of millions of Indian women volunteer to join these self-help groups. So there's a wonderful story of the province of Chennai, um, which has a particularly dynamic uh, network of women's self-help groups. And when COVID-19 erupted, one of the governor's first acts was to call upon the state's women's self-help groups to pitch in and help. So the women in these groups have been advising people on how they should behave to protect themselves, helping people to get treatment if necessary, um, 
ensuring that remote communities have regular deliveries of food and other essential supplies. Um, one group, actually not in Chennai, in a, another state, actually set up floating shops so that at a time when it was difficult to use the roads, sort of water-based communities had floating supermarkets that right. came to, to see them. Um, they also patrolled the streets to make sure that nobody's breaking the rules. And obviously they're so um, <laughs> terrifying as characters that people scuttle back in their home safely. So I think that's a wonderful example. You know, India's had a really tough time yeah. with COVID-19 for all sorts of reasons, but it, the death toll would be even worse without the women's self-help groups. And it's wonderful that this sense of the civic good and public spiritedness has played such an important part. This leaves me both uh, hopeful and full of um, full of good thoughts for the future as far as the societies are concerned, that we still think, uh, still feel the sense of, uh, of uh, community. But also it leaves me really, um, uh, how do you say, disappointed with the government, because actually the government should, should be uh, the ones that we can rely to during the hard times, during the times uh, of crisis. Uh, and this also should be the government that um, gives us the helping hand instead of the neighbor next door. I mean, it should work both ways, but the, the general sense is that most of the communities and societies have been uh, much more effective than the government actions. And this also um, brings me to another question. Uh, that during the pandemic and post-pandemic times, don't you think that generally designers should work more closely with uh, industry and with the technology and with the, the government, that designers should be included in the teams, in the collaborative teams, that designers should advise how to design healthcare system, how to design social system, how to bring social innovations, how to bring researchers and people of, uh, uh, of knowledge, so to say, uh, the experts, so they can give advice and help to design systems that actually work during hard times. Um, absolutely. I mean, I also, whilst I take your point that governance governments could and should do more. And obviously there are exceptions where they have managed COVID-19 very well. New Zealand would yeah. be one. Taiwan is a, another. Um, but there are far too many countries where the governments have been, you know, at best incompetent. Um, but uh, I do think that even in the most sort of efficiently run government COVID-19 treatment programs, there is a role for local communities. And I think there are huge benefits. There are certain things with individual care that really do need to be customised to the individual to meet their needs and wishes. And actually, many of those um, services are best provided within a local community uh, where those needs and wishes can be efficiently analysed. But I absolutely agree that designers should be consulted much, much earlier in the development of whether it's COVID-19 treatment programmes, um, public information campaigns, um, economic relief programmes to protect the economy and and citizens from the financial um, devastation that a pandemic and lockdown like this can bring. But I do think whilst we're nowhere near a perfect situation, huge progress has been made with that in recent years. I mean, my book, um, Hello World, Where Design Meets Life, came out in 2013. And I have always written for general media like the New York Times. So um, not necessarily for design specialists, trying to convince the general reader of the importance of design. And so I launched the book at all the literary festivals, the book festivals in Britain. And I was asked at every single festival, so what is design and what yeah. does it have to do with politics and the environment? When Design as an Attitude came out in 2018, so five years later, I still had lots of tricky questions, but not those. There really had been, I know this is a tiny anecdotal observation, but there really had been among those people who were sort of, I don't know, you'd call them cultural consumers or the yeah. literati of Britain. There was a much more enlightened understanding of design. And 
friends who work in social design in particular, who have lots of political connections, are constantly embedding themselves in different fields, say that this is partly positive because people genuinely do think design is an a historically undervalued tool that can be useful in enabling us to find new solutions to horrific ingrained problems. But secondly, it's desperation because, I mean, a social scientist friend turned social designer, Hilary Cotton, said that among social scientists, there's a general acceptance that many of the methodologies and ideologies that have driven the field for very long were 20th century. I mean, psychologists say the same thing of their field. They know that they're no longer fit for purpose. They're not sure what should replace them. They don't see design as this glorious panacea, but they do see it as something potentially useful and interesting that they could and should experiment with. That's a massive change. And I mentioned before how briskly countries in Southeast Asia responded to SARS and embedded design in a much more sophisticated way in their healthcare system since. And exactly the same applies to many African countries, the the more economically robust um, and politically robust ones that suffered from Ebola. They had the means to ensure that they started to build national healthcare systems that could help to deal with future epidemics and pandemics. And they were quick to convert them into COVID-19 treatment centres. So people do learn the lessons from the past and they are willing to embrace design as a key part of the future process. Do you think that we can implement design without the lessons learned? That it would be so obvious for people that we don't need to uh, witness the hardship, the the, the turmoils, the uh, bankruptcy of uh, you know, of trust, of uh, economies, just to have the lessons learned so we can implement the good design. But we, I mean, generally, we, a society and the people we choose to represent us in the government would know that it is, it is vital to engage designers beforehand to know that when you come up to something, it's good to take a team of people that actually know, that have data, that are scientists, that their knowledge is based on experience and on facts, and to um, have something designed prior to, to have something thought of prior to, instead of, uh, you know, uh, taking the consequences and having the lessons learned, and only after that, build on experience. Do you think this is at all possible nowadays? Um, Well, ideally, of course, it should happen. But I think as well as embedding designers within those teams of other specialists, the design community has to be much more open to specialists from other fields experimenting with design. So we've had some fantastic examples on design emergency. Dr. Marco Ranieri, one of the top critical care specialists in actually in the world, not just in Italy, who realised that critical care ventilators have enough capacity to respirate more than one patient at once. So collaborated with some industrial designer friends in Bologna, where he's based, um, to literally put a double nozzle at the end of this incredibly hyper-engineered, super sophisticated ventilator to respirate two patients simultaneously. A blindingly simple idea, but incredibly affected. We also interviewed two women doctors in Pakistan, um, Sara Kumar Ifat Safar and Sara Kuram, and they had experimented with telemedicine. They um, realized there were lots of what are called doctor brides like them, mm-hmm. qualified doctors who'd stopped practicing when they got married and had children because of cultural pressure, who wanted to practice from home, and that actually telemedical networks using apps or live video links were a brilliant way of enabling them to continue to practice. And people all over Pakistan, which is a country of 200 million people, fewer than half of whom have access to a doctor, that it could really make a massive difference in improving accessibility to and the quality of healthcare there. So I think those are two examples of people from dramatically different fields and indeed different areas of medicine who've embraced design in a particularly imaginative way already to great effect. And there will be more and more examples like that. Uh, You need to to, um, be courageous. You need to take courage of being mistaken and uh, of being brave enough to try 
uh, and to make other people to collaborate with you in order to uh, to achieve the success. Uh, and as you were mentioning, the two doctors that were um, doing the uh, t- sort of telephone uh, healing, if you can say so. <laughs> well, video links and apps, yeah, so telemedicine. Telemedicine this is something that has been implemented in many countries within Europe and all over the world, basically, right now. And basically, in Poland, what we are doing is uh, it's a telemedicine actually nonstop, unless you are so sick that you need to go to the hospital or ill. So this is, uh, this is amazing that you can um, witness that, that all over the world. Um, you also uh, define design as an agent of change, which can, he- which can help us to make sense of what is happening and to turn it to our advantage. And this is, uh, this is also something you've been mentioning before, that um, people used to think of design as, as an aesthetic form, so to say, as a tool of advertising. And uh, you also say that design is an attitude, is an agent of social change, of, uh, of social responsibility of a designer. Uh, we, we've discussed that briefly a minute ago, uh, but uh, how can design be responsible at all? I mean, uh, how can, I know it's dependent on designers, but how can you persuade the designers to design responsibly, to think of something else than their egos, to think of something else than sales, to think of something else than their fame and publicity? Oh, I think um, designers are already doing that. I don't think they need any persuading. I mean, if you think of, say, the Milan Furniture Fair, Milan Design Week, which is still seen as a sort of epicentre of the design world, albeit rooted in furniture design. You know, 10 years ago, if you went there and went to the student shows, the young designers, if you asked them what their ambitions were, it was basically that they wanted to be richer and more famous than Philippe Stark. And that was their aim. Now they want to save the world and that is absolutely fantastic and I think that that's partly a reflection of our time you know this is an extraordinary time of activism it and also it's a time when we face horrific threats and there is a general acceptance of that not just a terrifying global pandemic which medical professionals had been warning governments all over the world could strike us at any time for years but the climate emergency the um, explosion of uh, the outcry of rage at the killing of George Floyd and the outrage against systemic racism in so many countries, the refugee crisis, which is still accelerating in Europe, the accelerating advance of so many technologies and growing technophobia and terror that they will affect our lives negatively rather than positively. I mean, um, I remember um, after in the first Pe- Women's March on London being very taken by lots of the incredible signs that people were carrying. And, you know, some of them looked fabulous. You know, they were works of sort of great imagination and creativity. And one of the most basic signs I saw, it was literally sort of a rectangle, a horrible shade of orange with somebody had used a Sharpie to sort of write on it. And it said too much to fit on one sign. And that just summed up the state of the world at the moment. And now we have a killer pandemic thrown into the equation. So I think designers have rallied to help. And critically, and this is one of the big themes of design as an attitude, this is an age when we have a new generation of designers who, because of very basic digital tools, are able to operate independently and to define their own way of working and to define and pursue their own objectives. Um, You know, design used to be something that was largely a commercial tool and was largely executed under instruction from an employer, a client, or whoever. But now, um, because of, you know, such basic digital tools, they seem too obvious to mention, but because of crowdfunding, designers can raise substantial sums of money. If you take the ocean cleanup, the Dutch social enterprise, which aims to clear plastic trash from the oceans, they raised over 40 million US dollars 
dollars in crowdfunding before they even started their tests. There was fierce criticism of their plans. Scientists said they wouldn't work. Um, environmentalists said they would kill or damage marine life, so they'd cause more problems than they'd cure. But because they'd raised so much money, they were independent. They continued with the prototyping, the testing, and they finally got a live system that worked. They've now developed a nifty new system called the Interceptor that operates to clear trash from rivers to stop them it from ever getting to the ocean. Now, right. because they were independent, they could operate like that. But, you know, also for this new generation of, um, it wasn't, I wish I could claim, I coined the phrase designers and attitude. It's actually Laszlo Woolley Nash, yeah. one of my favourite um, historic design heroes in the 1940s. Um, because of the new breed of attitudinal designers, you know, they've also got social media to raise awareness of their work. In the olden days, designers had to sort of hire PR consultancies, which young designers couldn't possibly attempt to do. But now they can generate their own networks of collaborators, suppliers, funders, and so on. Social designers like Hilary Cottom can run incredibly sophisticated computer programs on, you know, super affordable machines to um, analyze all the necessary data. So designers have these super efficient relatively inexpensive tools that enable them to define their own way of working, pursue their own objectives. And of course, generationally, they're much more likely um, to certainly the most imaginative designers to want to apply themselves to the big issues of our time. And I think, um, I don't know about your institution, but in the UK, furniture and product design courses are closing all over the country because not enough students are applying for not them. Yet. We are um, hoping for it. For, for <laughs> I'm sure it will happen. You know, here, social design, humanitarian design, it's booming. And, you know, that's hugely heartening. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, we've been chatting before we uh, we got online about the current situation of um, uh, COVID-19, both in Poland and in the UK. And I said that in Poland, it's not an existent, that people in Poland sort of stopped believing in it ever being a true uh, phenomenon. Uh, but my question is whether in such case, when people are starting to treat the pandemic and the virus itself as something that is a part of our lives, lives um, whether the designers should design our lives instead of means of fighting with the virus itself. I mean, like, let's take the social distancing. It's being forgotten that one, uh, one meter and a half or two meters is a it, safe distance. So maybe designers should design our public spaces in such a way that we would not think about, you know, keeping the distance, ra rather that the distance itself should be, you know, avoiding us from meeting nearer than two meters, if you if you mm. know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely do. Yeah. I think that process has already begun and it began a, a long time ago. And whilst there are some people who are undisciplined, you know, the anti-vax campaigners in the US, yeah. people who say that wearing a mask is an infringement of their civil liberties and so on. I think most people have been incredibly disciplined. They, or, you know, it would have been unthinkable, I think, for all of us that we could have spent six months under lockdown. You know, when lockdown began, I assume that by August, yeah. You know, we would all return to what people were calling the new normal. We know it's going to be much more radically different than that. But I think most people have been disciplined. And I've been hugely impressed by the imagination and resourcefulness and resilience that people have used during this time. Um, there is a general acceptance, I think, among fellow citizens and politically that with COVID-19, it's all about managing it. It's it's yeah. like any other form of infection or virus. It's never going to disappear appear from our lives to be purged completely. But we will need to become much more efficient about treating it, which is a process that's already underway, and also make amendments in our lives to deal with it. So 
after SARS in Southeast Asia, wearing masks, which had been fairly common already, certainly for people with colds and flus in some Southeast Asian countries like Japan. But mask wearing became much more general. So there weren't the same ridiculous objections to it that there have been in other countries with from rabid right-wing so-called libertarians. Um, but I also think that one of the fascinating things about so many of the aspects of the design response to COVID-19 is that it hasn't come from within the design community. So if you look at social distancing, many of my favorite examples of it and the most ingenious and effective examples have come from people who aren't designers at all. So, um, you know, there were wonderful images of school kids in an elementary school in China whose teachers had made individual masks for each child in the class that was sort of new to school. They were joining school for the first time. Um, we're in bright colours, lots of reflective paper and silly shapes and patterns, but with huge wands yeah. Yeah, to mark the that, social yeah. distance. Because how on earth do you get a bunch of five or six year olds to social to distance them, yeah. from one another? So they were all sitting there looking incredibly cute and proud of their um, masks. Another teacher had simply given um, plastic wings to their kids. Another one had made very elaborate wings, again, demarcate, demarcating the space. I saw images of a bar in Germany which had used um, plastic sort of um, brightly coloured swimming pool floats, um, <laughs> literally like sort of long sausages to show how far apart people should sit in bars. Yeah. I mean, these are amazing examples of innate design resourcefulness, which are totally improvisational and instinctive. And another parallel would be the community support groups I spoke about earlier. As I said, in India, they began in um, eight. 1918, immediately after World War One, with Bombay influenza, and have had a huge impact on India ever since. They're even thought to have significantly helped with the Indian independence movement, because many of the early groups were run by young radicals who were supporters of Mahatma Gandhi, and then became part of the independence movement. They had credibility within often very remote rural communities that wouldn't normally trust a sort of wealthy yeah. young intellectual. Um, and so really did play a prominent part in a significant political change in that country. So I don't think we should underestimate um, common sense, self-discipline and our innate resilience and resourcefulness. They're very valuable. Uh, there are some uh, some branches of uh, global economics that have been especially hit by the virus. This is tourism, fashion, events and cultural sectors. Um, can you highlight some examples of some solutions, designs and proposal, proposals of how those, how those branches can uh, you know, ri rise from the crisis? Is, are there any solutions for them, like tourism? Is, you know, we, we are witnessing the whole new definition of how people will uh, travel. There, there, there are no business travels anymore. I mean, there are not needed actually because we can do the teleconference we don't need to shake hands despite the fact that networking is being neglected but we can network in other in other ways but do you have any examples that you can share that can really work in the future or work already well luckily yes i mean i'm chair of the boards of trustees of two art galleries here in britain the hepworth wakefield in yorkshire and chisholm hell gallery in london so obviously we had to contingency plan throughout this process, um, how to close the galleries for lockdown, how to manage them financially, and also how to reopen them safely so people would feel confident about visiting, but crucially would not be exposed to infection. Now, in the visual arts with museums and art galleries, unless they're very ancient and historic and higgledy-piggledy with lots of small spaces, it generally is possible to do that. So, you know, we have introduced um, sensible social distancing measures. There are, you know, one-way routes around all the exhibitions so people don't cluster together. There are some areas of the galleries at the Hepworth Wakefield, we have a brilliant um, family and kids programme. Um, so at school holidays, 
holidays, weekends, the whole building is full of, you know, families and kids at workshops or parents um, using the facilities to do creative activities with their kids. That's been much more difficult to COVID proof. But in terms of welcoming people back to the galleries in an environment where they can feel safe and we can be confident that we're welcoming them back responsibly, design has helped enormously to enable us to do that. Um, with the performing arts, you know, theatre, opera houses, cinemas and so on, it's much, much, much more difficult to do. Um, the same applies to sort of big rock gigs, festivals and so on. But obviously there are technological solutions and, you know, in Europe we're about to start the next round of fashion weeks and um, friends in the fashion industry say there'll be an incredible explosion of experimentation um, with tech designers in augmented reality. Um, that And apparently a lot of the graduates um, from fashion design degree courses um, in the last couple of years, if they're technologically sophisticated, many of them have focused on this. So people are experimenting with very inventive, different ways of showing fashion rather than the very old fashioned sort of um, mm -hmm. fashion show. In terms of tourism, that is, of course, very difficult because people are understandably nervous about traveling long distances. And many people feel it's irresponsible to do so. But there are some examples of communication design exercises that have addressed that. And throughout um, the COVID-19 crisis, one of the countries that has impressed me the most with respect to every aspect of its management of the crisis and has used design as a particularly imaginative tool is New Zealand. So when I looked around for really great international role models of the best public information design program, which definitely was not the UK. It's completely chaotic and confusing and just befuddles everyone. New Zealand was really the only standout. It's clear, it's accessible, it's engaging, it's empathic. They've also, and we had a, an interview on Design Emergency with Mark Dalton, who was its creative director, and he explained um, in a fascinating way, the way that they'd had to design the program at incredible speed, I think four days from start to finish to get the sign off. I just need to interrupt and say that it is all because they have fabulous prime minister. It is well, she's good. a brilliant prime minister, of course. Yeah. And of course, we all know that the countries that have coped best have generally had women right. yeah. um, prime ministers. Um, but there's also, because New Zealand dealt so efficiently with COVID-19, you know, not solely because of a brilliantly designed public information programme, but yeah. I will go to my grave saying it <laughs> played an important part. And that's great because it embraced every new form of media but um, also information design is one of those traditional roles that design has played historically in helping yeah. us to manage crises, the Isotope Institute's brilliant work in the early 20th century and so on. Um, so a recovery design, information design program was also developed. And the focus was very much on the assumption that people wouldn't necessarily be able to leave New Zealand and there wouldn't be the usual influx of tourists into New Zealand. But it was all about travelling in New Zealand, making the most of an incredible country and its amazing natural beauty and all the things that New Zealanders often miss out on because they're jetting off to Europe or wherever. Um, all, again, presented in a very accessible, clear and engaging way. I found myself longing to go to New Zealand as soon as air bridges um, are lifted. Um, and also focusing on the local economy. So New Zealand makers, retailers, artisans and so on. So it was just a very imaginative way of capturing people's imagination, giving them positive reasons to stay at home and to help their fellow citizens by regenerating the economy. But then um, I have to say I was absolutely charmed. Cycling through London last week, I sort of looked up, there was a massive billboard um, to encourage tourism to New York. And I thought, oh, no, you know, this is totally <laughs> insensitive at this time. And then I saw the wording and it began, we miss you too. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you back to New York. And I just thought, how wonderful. I immediately yeah. remembered the fabulous times I've had in New York over the years. It made me full of nostalgia, longing to go back there and looking forward to my next trip. And 
I felt that was a 21st century marketing campaign. You know, there was the communication. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I love New York was me, me, me. What do I think of this city? This was we care about you. We appreciate with you. We're not bullying you into coming back and spending your dollars here now. We just miss you. Exactly. And yeah. who can resist that? So I found that incredibly charming and thought, you know, um, we were talking about Victor Papanek earlier, who hated the advertising industry. Uh, but at times it gets it right. And this was one of those times. Yeah. And uh, we were mentioning communication. And also you and Paola plan to uh, publish a book on design emergency. Who would you like to address this book? And do you think that it will be a guide for designers or it will be a guide for the governments or uh, maybe it will be just a chronicle of good examples of how to handle a crisis and some guidelines for the future? Well, we obviously being ever ambitious, we hope it will be all those things. I mean, there's a sort of... um, intermediary stage in that um, we were thrilled when Wallpaper magazine invited us to be guest editors of its October issue this year as Design Emergency in our guides, which obviously is taking a lot of the work we've done to a broader audience. And um, so we've had a fantastic collaboration with them. And I think it's something, it's nearly 40 pages of the magazine are devoted to Design Emergency and the cover, a series of covers. Um, And in that, we have um, various interviews with Paola and I, with Frith Kerr of Studio Frith, um, the the graphic designer who did the incredible graphics with her team for Design Emergency. And it was brilliant Mm -hmm. fun for us to collaborate with her. But also there are five interviews with five of the global design leaders during the pandemic. So they're transcripts of our Q&As with them for the IG Lives. And then five interviews with the global design leaders post-pandemic who will take us forward to the future. And we want the book to be a combination of those two things. So there will be much more information about the sort of standout design responses to COVID-19. Um, so the pro- really stellar projects that we chose to investigate in Design Emergency, because we do believe that this will continue to be an incredible case study of what design can do yeah. in a terrible global crisis in all sorts of different ways, whether it's information design, data design, designing medical equipment, personal protective equipment, whatever, um, or galvanizing local communities. But the really important issue now is to focus on the future. It's to accept that we face massive global challenges, that our lives were not fit for purpose in the way they were designed and run before this terrible calamity, and that we need to make them fit for purpose for the future. And this is the time to do it. So about a third of the book will be on the COVID-19 response and relief effort, the other two thirds, the majority of the book will be looking forward to the future. I mean, as as Paula says, she means to be optimistic that we will always have something interesting to talk about in design emergency. Um, But actually, it's rather despondent, (laughs) taken rationally. There's always a design emergency. But of course, there is, you know, we've already done special editions on Black Lives Matter, um, in which we invited people from that movement um, to organise it. And we recently did a a Beirut Blast special edition two incredible designers from Lebanon discuss that and the design response. So the, uh, the one before last question is when we can expect the book to be published? Um, well, we hope. I mean, we haven't. Uh, we actually plan to focus on that over the summer, but then the wallpaper opportunity came up, and we really felt that was sort of too good and too interesting yeah. to pass up. And it I was a like- wonderful experience. And it will go on sale next week, in fact, in the UK. I think probably the following week in Poland and, and internationally. Um, so we're now focusing on the book. So my task for the weekend is to complete the proposal. Um, so we would hope it would come out either at the end of next year or more probably early 2022. 2022. Um, Among many things that you do, do you find time to get inspiration from something else than design? Yes, I have tons of interest. I mean, that's actually why I love writing about design, because I have so many interests. I'm fascinated by politics. I love literature, 
art. I'm very engaged with through my pro bono governance roles. Um, I love film. I love hiking. I'm a massive Manchester United supporter. So I have many, wow. many interests. And um, one of the reasons I love writing about design is it's completely embedded in every aspect of our lives. Right. Yeah. And so when something as dramatic happens, and also it should be pointed out, the first half of my career, I was a proper journalist. I worked for the Financial Times as a foreign correspondent. So I wrote about politics, economics, the corporate sector. And I've been lucky. I was the International Herald Tribune, then the New York Times first design critic. So I didn't have a sort of grand tradition to follow. I could make the job up Your as I went tradition. along. Yeah. And I I didn't do that systematically. But I, looking back, I think I treat design as a foreign correspondent treats right. their terrain. And so one of the things that I found fantastic during the pandemic, and I'm very wary of saying that because it's a selfish thing to say, given the terrible tragedy and anguish it caused for many people, was that my way of responding to any emergency, major or minor, is to sort of investigate it, find out about it, and work out how to deal with it. So to be able to um, use my skills to investigate it immediately and then communicate with a broader audience. You know, many of the best projects that I covered in Design in a Pandemic, Paula and I have covered in Design Emergency, are ones that other people alerted us to on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. You know, people from very different parts of the world, people we've never met and may never meet. So I'm incredibly grateful to them. And um, I've found like for me psychologically dealing with a situation like this I found being able to make a very small contribution by championing what I believe is the massively important role of design in treating an emergency like this has helped me immensely and I've been very touched by the incredible response that Paula and I have had outside and inside the design community um, to design emergency we're really thrilled with it. Great. Um, we have two questions from okay. um, our audience. The first question is from um, Isabella. And the question is about the ways of working you mentioned. I believe she mentions the ways of um, uh, designers work. What would you say is the biggest change in the designer's creative process during the pandemic? Or is there any difference in approach to the design process? Ooh. Um... Very interesting. I mean, if obviously a huge difference is home working, um, which is something that I personally have done for years. Yes. You know, I worked yeah. for the New York Times <laughs> for over 12 years and we I never thought of it like that. We always had a remote relationship, as actually I do with most of the media I work with. Um, so that transition to lockdown wasn't so radical for me. But for designer friends who are used to working within a studio, even if, you know, some of their colleagues may have worked from home or other countries for many years, they found it much more of a change, not necessarily because they felt that it diminished the sort of creativity and ingenuity and the conceptual strength of their design work, but because actually managing the studio was very difficult. Um, you know, Ilsa Crawford, who's a great friend, the brilliant yeah. um, interior designer, said that she realised very early on how incredibly efficient it is to just yell across the studio <laughs> to someone, you know, if you need to check something with them. Yeah. Uh, and and actually contacting them, whether it's text, email, phone, it's just much more labor intensive and time intensive. But, you know, human beings are resourceful and resilient. We've learned to adapt. So I think that's a big change. And um, this actually links to a point you made earlier in that with home working, it has worked fairly efficiently so far for many people. And I think that in most fields, we'll have a hybrid working model going forward, that most people will probably spend two or three days a week in their office. I mean, as a British politician pointed out at the weekend, actually, people aren't going back to work now, they're going back to the office. Most people who work in factories, warehouses, and so on, have had to um, continue working throughout the pandemic. Um, but for people to, thinking of returning to a, an office or a studio, they'll probably spend a couple of days at home and a couple of days there. 
And talking to people like Mark Dalton, the creative director of the excellent Unite Against COVID-19 campaign in New Zealand, he was saying that um, what really paid off for them and enabled them to produce a world-class campaign, my words, not his, in an incredibly short space of time was the network of trusted collaborators. That's the phrase he used that he'd built up over the years. And so he knew their strengths, he knew their weaknesses. They knew that they worked well with him. He could phone them at two in the morning if he needed to, and they would know he was serious and um, they would offer to help and they could have a straightforward conversation, it would have been much, much more difficult had he been setting up that network from scratch. And I think what people may miss out is bringing in new colleagues, testing out new people and new collaborators. I mean, in theory, you could argue that this time of sort of great threats, great danger will make us sort of seize the day and be much more experimental with our lives. I think it may also make us less reckless and more cautious and certainly I think with all the administrative problems that home working caused it possibly made people less willing to experiment with newcomers to their practices I think that is a big change for design practice but that will ease over time and hopefully we'll get a good balance. Yeah, I I totally agree with the fact that during the crisis, you would rather stick to the one you trust and you know, rather than experiment with something uh, even more new. And the second question is uh, from uh, Diana, and she's asking, if you met the designers of such badly designed PPE that you've been mentioning before, what, what would be your advice to them to help them improve their design in the times of the pandemic? Well, I think other people are far better equipped to advise them than I am. I mean, the PPE um, project that really impressed Paula and I was Creatives Taken Corona in Antwerp that I described. And because it was a collaboration between designers like Dries Verbruggen, who we interviewed about it, um, he is a co-founder of um, a conceptual design group in Antwerp and is particularly interested in sort of theories of manufacturing and designing new processes of manufacturing. But um, some of the people he partnered with worked for fashion companies in Antwerp. So they collaborated throughout with healthcare professionals at every level, whether they were first responders, doctors, nurses, and so on, to really find out what they needed and wanted from PPE. They then worked with you know, among the world's best pattern cutters. So Dries van Noten's chief pattern cutter actually designed and cut the patterns for the gowns, the coveralls, the hoods, the gloves, and and so on. They um, followed an open source design process throughout, so people could come in and point out if there were any flaws. They then posted all the design specifications and the patterns online. So thousands of people in other countries, I think from Ethiopia to Brazil to Morocco, have downloaded their Um, templates, because as Dries said, what's the point, given that they've put all this time and resource and specialist skill into developing them, why should other people in crisis situations have to waste time developing their own versions when they could share their templates with them? So I think it's that sort of practice from people who um, actually are capable of designing PPE, I am definitely not, that the sort of standard PPE designers would be very well served to talk to. Very last question, because I see our moderator is popping up with (laughs) more of them. Uh, But this is very last one. Uh, As many activities move to the internet, also shopping, do you think it will be easier to sell good design or will it be more difficult to find it? Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, I think... Um, And this applies to the question you asked earlier about, you know, is design responsible enough? I really do think that citizens are the best sort of police people for good design. So the better informed people are about design, the likelier they are to spot bad design or mediocre design and avoid it and to spot good or hopefully great design and embrace that and make it part of their lives. So I think the more that the average person knows about design, the better. And I think nothing can replace that Um, because we can't switch off design. You know, it's not if I think of all the things I love, like I'm passionately interested in contemporary art. So I go to see lots of 
exhibitions under normal circumstances. Now I can watch online talks, digital exhibitions, read more books and so on. Um, I'm not particularly interested in opera, um, so I avoid the opera. You can't avoid design. It's a ubiquitous part of every aspect of our lives. You can't switch it off. But what you can do is determine the quality of the design you engage with. So the better informed we are about that, the, um, the better off we'll all be. Now, clearly, it's if it comes to old-fashioned, three-dimensional products, it's much more difficult to make design decisions about them if you just see a, a digital rendering of them or a dodgy photograph online. But one incredibly useful aspect of online shopping is responsible retailers have star systems, comments. So one of the best general retailers in Britain is the John Lewis Partnership, which is a collective. Um, it prides itself on hiring high-caliber high sales assistants who are genuinely knowledgeable about their products. So, you know, I know nothing about fridges. If I need a new one, I know if I go to John Lewis, somebody will give me really high-caliber, intelligent, objective advice. Now I get it on John Lewis's website. And so I think that, you know, we've constantly, it goes back to our innate resourcefulness and resilience. When faced with the new, we find ways of instinctively responding to them from a design perspective to enable us to benefit from them rather than being impeded by them. So, I mean, as you may have guessed from this, I'm a very optimistic person yeah and you know my glass would always be half full or fuller and um so you know I do believe that you know yes we've had to make um very difficult decisions huge sacrifices radical changes in our behavior but I think people have risen to this challenge brilliantly and so the COVID-19 crisis I hope it will of course be looked back on as a terrible time of loss and destruction but if you look back historically many of the greatest design innovations you know that we've benefited from crisis. for decades yeah. if not centuries have come from crises so after the end of World War II I mean you know certainly in the UK because of the terrible bombing massive you know affordable housing programs our first socialist government schools hospitals parks and so on the whole of the welfare state which hillary cotton is now campaigning to redesign and the same applied in many other countries you know the cholera outbreaks all over the world throughout the 19th century really led to the modernization the design of hospitals that were fit for purpose clinics that were fit for purpose proper professional training for doctors and nurses i mean all of these are huge benefits and i refuse to believe that the covid 19 all the suffering of the covid 19 crisis won't yield some benefits for the survivors and you know it would be just so sad if that didn't happen and the design deserves to be at the forefront it's proven its worth during this crisis and I believe that makes design much better placed to play a more meaningful and complex role in our lives in future. Let's leave our audience with this optimistic approach. <laughs> Uh, Alice, it was wonderful uh, to have this conversation with you and to be able to see your point of view on design and how design responds to COVID and, and generally to chat with you on design. Uh, thank you for your time and for being with us. Uh, now I will, I will turn to Polish to say goodbye to our audience. May I just thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. It was lovely of you to do so. And thank you for asking such intelligent and interesting questions. And to the audience, I'm just so sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, but it's lovely to talk to you all. And thank you for the audience's questions, which were great too. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Dziękuję Wam bardzo za e, dzisiejsze spotkanie. Pamiętajcie, że zapis naszej rozmowy możecie oglądać na naszych mediach społecznościowych i zapraszam na kolejne spotkania z cyklu Mistrzowie. Do zobaczenia.